Our second look at what is a patient is a look at our more recent history, the parts of it that have medical consequences that we will also trace in the next couple of short lectures. Here is a table of things that have happened recently in human evolution, things that have happened since our last common ancestor with chimpanzees. We have a, an alteration in the way that our brains grow. We have prolonged postnatal brain growth and delayed myelinization. These are probably both associated with our capacity for learning, with our heightened intelligence, uh, and they appear to be associated also with childhood, which is a condition that does not exist in chimpanzees. Chimpanzees transition much more directly from being infants into being juveniles. Our brain size has been much increased. We have a descended larynx, which is very probably associated with our capacity for language. We have a high density of eccrine sweat glands that gives us enhanced sweating capacity. And we also have increased ability to do endurance running. So both of these are probably associated with the ability to hunt down prey by endurance running on the savanna. That also has to do with our hair loss. So we are relatively naked of hair compared to chimpanzees. And when a woman goes into labor, when a human woman goes into labor, she has earlier onset and a longer duration of labor than does a chimpanzee. Interestingly, we are able to cry. cry crying is a social signal of distress and it is not something that chimpanzees can do. So it is an enhanced communication ability. It's part of our body language. We have enhanced T cell function. They are relatively hypersensitive. So that, that gives us uh, enhanced immune resistance. And we have a thumb, which is longer and a little bit more dis distally placed. We have larger muscles on our thumb. And that also has to do with our ability to manipulate tools. In addition, our young are born relatively helpless with more need for parental care for a two-year period. We have a short interbirth interval, and the combination of those two traits means that human reproduction is necessarily social. Mothers need help, otherwise they wouldn't be able to pull off a short interbirth interval with a relatively helpless young. We have delayed maturation, so we start reproducing a bit later than do chimpanzees and bonobos. We have menopause. Now, if chimpanzees lived as long as we do, we might observe menopause in them as well. But in fact, our reproductive cycle matches theirs pretty well. It's just that they die just about at the point when they stop reproducing, and we continue to survive. And that has to do with our enhanced longevity, which is probably due to our social defense and our ability to avoid death from predation. Now. What has been our recent history of movement on the planet? Homo sapiens evolved from another hominid ancestor in Africa about 150 to 100,000 years ago, perhaps a little earlier, and spread out of Africa somewhere around 100,000 years ago. It is thought that we paused in the Mideast for a while, and it is likely, as you'll see in a moment, that the first to move out of the Mideast went in the direction of Europe. Others, however, probably fairly rapidly got down into Australia and uh, into New Guinea. Then, somewhere around 25 to 35,000 years ago, East Asia was colonized, and about 12,000 years ago, People made it across the Bering Strait and then spread rapidly all the way down to the tip of South America, moving very quickly. The colonization of the islands of the Pacific is much more recent. That probably came out through Southeast Asia, possibly Taiwan, and went first to the Central Pacific and then from there to Hawaii, Easter Island, and New Zealand. Interestingly, by the way, Madagascar also was only recently colonized, probably about 1,000 or 1,200 years ago. Africa contains more genetic diversity than the whole rest of the planet combined. As we migrated, different groups encountered different diseases and diets. 
and the groups that moved into America Poly and Polynesia left some diseases behind, including measles, smallpox, plague, influenza, and typhus, and having been free of those diseases for on the order of about 10,000 years, when they re-encountered them, when Europeans then colonized those areas, they experienced very high mortality rates. One recent result has been great genetic variation in ability to resist disease and to metabolize drugs. So if we look at the global population of humans, those are two very important medical characteristics that vary among individuals and that are related to this recent history. Now, we're going to take a look at what we can learn from details of the human genome. And I would like to start by noting that all humans are nearly identical genetically. Our genome is so large that both of the following statements are true. I am genetically 99.9% .9 identical to you. That means we share 99.9% .9 of our 3.3 billion nucleotides in our DNA sequence. At the same time, that 0.1% means that my genome differs from yours at up to 3.3 million positions. This is a consequence of thinking about very large numbers. So the first suggests how conservative inheritance is, and the second points to the flexibility of inheritance. Now, note that all nucleotide changes are not equivalent. You can't really tell the difference in the organism just from counting nucleotide changes, because some are neutral, some alter the structure of a single protein, and some change the control over large genetic networks. So not all nucleotide changes are equal. Genetic differences among human individuals are of all these types. So here is a picture of human genetic diversity. This is from a paper in Science in 2008. A group headed by Lee at Stanford looked at 928 unrelated individuals from 51 populations. And they looked at 650,000 single nucleotide polymorphisms in each individual. So this picture that you see has 928 individuals arrayed along the x-axis. And the y-axis is showing 650,000 single nucleotide polymorphisms. The colors come from a program called Structure. And Structure is looking for groups, groupings, in the variation. It can be set to different levels. And in this case, they found that the best way to describe the data was to use seven groups. And you see those seven groups here, Africa, Middle East, Europe, South Central Asia, East Asia, Oceania, and America. That can be tuned. You can actually set structure to look for other groups. So these single nucleotide polymorphisms, those are differences between two strands of DNA at a single site. And what you see reflected here are those where one of the differences, the, the rarer of the, of the two differences, is at least 1% of the population. Now, using that same data, they built a phylogenetic tree. This is the tree, and you can see here that it's rooted down here where all of the people in these groups are in Africa. There's a very long branch here, which indicates the migration out of Africa at about 100,000 years ago. Uh, this branch here, moving into East Asia and then over towards uh, North America, is at about 40,000 years. These people here are in the Middle East. These people here are in Europe. These people here are at, at sort of at the boundary between Europe and Southeast Asia, Southwest Asia. And then these people are in China, Japan, Korea, Southeast Asia. And then up here we have North Americans and South Americans. And here we have people in Melanesia. Now, if you take that data, you are able, because there's so much data, to discriminate local groups. So here, for example, we can see here are the Basques in this group, here are the French, here, here are the Italians, here are the Tuscans, the Sardidians are off here, the Russians are out here, the Orcadians, the people in the Orkney Islands, are up here. 
and the Atagaeids, who are uh, in the Northwest Caucasus, are down here. So it looks like with this data, you can see quite a bit of differentiation of what we would call ethnic groups. But these are principal components, okay? So this is a statistical abstraction of a huge data set. And I'd like you to note how much of the variation is being accounted for by these principal components. The first one accounts for 2.4%, and the second one accounts for 1.6%. So if you add that up and you look at total human genetic diversity, we're only looking at a pattern that's being discriminated with 4% of total human genetic diversity here. If we then ask, how is human genetic diversity allocated between individuals, among groups like the ones we've just looked at, among larger divisions such as people coming from different continents and so forth, we find a very reliable pattern. Most genetic differences are among individuals, and only about 6 to 11 percent of those differences are among what we call races. Okay? So here are the results of four different studies of increasing technical sophistication. This last one is the one that we just looked at. They used from three to seven groups. Then they had populations and samples within those groups. So that would be a Within populations, that would be variation among individuals. In this last data set, it was 89%. Among populations, then we can see that among all of those groups that we saw, the population groups in that slide, this was 2.1%. In some of the other studies, it goes up to about 8%. So that's like differences between the French and the Russians and so forth. And then when we look among groups, that's somewhere between about 6 and 11 percent. So these are the things that people would call races. The take-home message on this is that race is not a very significant biological phenomenon. And when we look at skin color, which most people use as their method of discriminating race, we can make the following observations. Our primate ancestors had light skin under dark hair. So their exposed skin was light at birth and darkened with age. If you take a chimp and you shave off all of its uh, hair, it has a fairly light skin color. About two to three million years ago, we evolved black skin to protect ourselves against skin cancer and against folate depletion when we lost our hair. And we probably lost our hair to improve our ability to sweat, to cool us down, because we had become long distance runners to hunt down prey. So when did we evolve other skin colors? Well, it was probably between about 10 and 100,000 years ago. In some cases, fairly quickly, and it was done to improve vitamin D synthesis in cool climates where people wore clothes. Skin color is therefore a superficial trait. It's coded by a small number of genes, and it can evolve quickly. It is caught in a trade-off between the benefits of vitamin D and the costs of skin cancer and folate depletion. So to summarize, we've evolved changes in many traits of medical significance since our sh shared ancestors with chimpanzees and bonobos. We emerged from Africa about 100,000 years ago. We are all Africans. As we moved into environments with different diets and diseases, we evolved genetic differences in disease resistance and in drug metabolism. Both of them are quite now, quite variable now among patients. Race is a, mostly a social construct. It's not a biological reality. But there are genetic differences because the genome is so vast. There are genetic differences associated with eth ethnicity that do contain useful medical information. So we need a nuanced view of what we can learn from the fact that someone comes from Africa or comes from Europe.